Um, no, I don't want to say that. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Mr. Feels podcast episode number two. I am your host, Tyler May. And I'm Laura. And today we're going to be interviewing my friend Kyle Marshall, who struggles with anxiety. Kyle, what is up and how anxious are you feeling about this podcast? Uh, I'm meeting (laughs) some new people, so my anxious level, I'm saying I'm at a good solid six right now. I'm a good solid six. A solid six. All right, cool. We'll get you up to a nine by the end of this episode. (laughs) Uh, So Kyle and I have been friends for a while now. Uh, He does uh, YouTube videos just like me. He's been on the platform for like seven seven years, Kyle. um cool and you also run a couple other podcasts called assumptions and what's the other one whatever this is is the other one okay cool yeah i really like assumptions i don't really listen to the other one but we you can do it that with what you will that's uh that's kind um, of a current theme that i hear from a lot of people it's like i like assumptions uh, i like the other one oh uh, <laughs> oh i'm right. sorry <laughs> uh but anyways uh kyle has definitely uh Got a lot of problems, just like we all do, um, and so um, I, I'd like to exactly numerically we're going through each um, one, and so uh, could you just kind of explain uh, what anxiety is to those who probably haven't experienced it or what it's like to you uh, before we dive into yeah, everything? Absolutely, this is really an interesting time to be doing this because I just made a video about this very topic. Has oh, I thought you were going to say I just had a panic attack <laughs> like right before. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, I wanted your pain to be real, Kyle, as you came on this <laughs> podcast. Uh, for me, it's a feeling like it's really hard to describe like how you get really super clinical and, and describe how anxiety is really your body being thrown into like a fight or flight situation in even like mm pretty low key situations it's not like a bear is running at you it's like oh someone invited you on a coffee date and now you're like super like can't handle can't handle it for 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 me it's 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 a feeling and very specifically what that feeling is for me is that there's this um i i kind of described almost like bees are flying around in my stomach is kind of what it Mm. feels like and then it's like something is grabbing my eyes and like the back of my throat (laughs) So it's like almost like a clenching up of all of my different senses and then me trying to figure out how to combat that. So that's the feeling. That's what what anxiety is like to me. That's what the feeling is like. Wow. Uh, You did a really good job explaining that. Um, Very sensory, I guess. I've never heard somebody... I feel like every time I talk to somebody with anxiety, they explain it in a different way. That gives me a different perspective. Uh, but I feel like everybody uh, struggles with anxiety to an extent. Would you agree with that? I would that? agree with that. I, I think that there is just normal situations that people get anxious about. I mean, there's the, there's that classic joke um, that Jerry Seinfeld talks about, which is that more people are afraid of public speaking than they are of death. So if you go to a funeral, it's like the guy who's in the coffin and has a better deal than the person who's actually speaking about it. Uh, but it, but it was kind of true, like for that or, you know, traveling is an anxiety ridden time because yeah, it just thinks yeah. like outside of your control. So I think people deal with anxiety on a daily level. What I did, I was I was mm-hmm. diagnosed at in my early 20s with generalized anxiety disorder is what they actually gave okay. the name of it to. Uh, for me, uh, which just means that I tend to get anxiety in situations that shouldn't have anxiety. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so in order to, like, when you got that diagnosis, um, what is the difference, say, between somebody who experiences anxiety on a daily level, you know, in basic situations, and then actually being anxious to a degree that you are diagnosed with a disorder. Yes, yeah, so I'm probably going to get the name wrong, but it has to do with, uh, or at least how they described it to me, was that there was a, a chemical imbalance almost in, in the brain. Uh, mm-hmm. And I can't remember what the actual thing is called. Uh, but essentially, there's a chemical that's released, like in that uh, fight or flight situation, when you're faced with like, uh, external forces that gets released and then your body says okay you are now are in this situation and now we're going to act accordingly 
which means that normally, like, your breathing gets shallower. Like adrenaline? Like, thank you. Um, it's, it's okay. like a really easy name. I couldn't remember it. But it's like, it kind of suppress or uh, overactive, I guess, and an anxiety inducing way. Cortisol. And cortisol, cortisol, I think, yeah, might be maybe. the one. Yeah. So I think yeah, both of yes. those those <laughs> types of things are, are part and parcel to it. Uh, so how it's different, for, for me at least, is that, yeah, that because there's that imbalance uh, in situations where it, I mean, there might be slight anxiety, it kind of shoots up through the roof for me uh, mm. so that it's harder to deal with. Yeah. One of the mm-hmm. reasons why I'm excited um, to do this episode is because I just have recently had appointments with like my, uh, my psychologist and my psych- psychiatrist and, and they're like, dude, I think you have, anxiety i'm like really like i don't because i'm very hesitant to like accept that i'm really hesitant to like accept anything on on mental illness or like having to do with your brain i think that's healthy to an extent like you don't want to like accept things or think oh i have this it's kind of like hypochondriac is uh i feel like what that is and i think it's worse to accept everything rather than it is to be cautious and so i like err on the side of caution but i like I want to use, I'm going to be using this episode as like an experiment to like figure out like what aspects that you have are similar and like, because I've started to recently take a medication that's helping a little bit with it or is supposed to. What medication is it? And like I've, ah, it's called propanol, I think. Um, uh, I, I think it's more of like to deal with side effects of other medication that I have with like trimmers and stuff, but they also said it'll help with, um, anxiety. So like I haven't. I think I've noticed a little bit of different, uh, probably not. Um, but like, I don't know, Laura, have you ever had like problems with anxiety and stuff? I don't think we've ever talked about it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so, um, so Kyle, I'm, I was diagnosed bipolar two a few years ago and, um, anxiety is a big part of what that experience was for me. Like I would go into like hypomania, which can be euphoric, but it was also often accompanied by a lot of anxiety, you know? And, um, I, when was it a few years ago, I went and saw, um, uh, an acupuncturist and herbal medicine doctor. And she like went through and did this whole diagnosis of my glandular system. And she looked at me and she was like, wow, your adrenals are so, stressed and so exhausted that my adrenal glands were um, really incapable of regulating adrenaline and cortisol in the correct ways. And so I was actually just getting these little flashes of adrenaline throughout my day. Um, So I'd be like walking down the street, you know, or in some very normal situation. But because my system was so fatigued, I would get this like adrenaline rush as if something had sparked that that would require me to then, yeah, like fight or flight kind of yeah. situation um i get so, that a lot when i'm playing smash brothers i'm not even joking though like if it's if it's down to 1v1 like my heart is pumping like i'm i feel my heart literally increase like three so times help me i if start to watch i will be freaking out <laughs> oh man i literally go into like almost a st- state of hypomania i know i always need to oh, make man. sure that i stop at some point <laughs> but I'll, I'll let you continue you, Laura. <laughs> so you recognize the feeling. No, I'm just, I, yes, I'm very familiar with, with what that feels like and kind of the, um, the faster, I get really faster thoughts to, you know, that are often, um, I mean, most people probably know exactly what I say, what I mean when I say an anxious thought pattern, <laughs> you just get really wor. I get really worrisome and overactive and start thinking about all the things I have to do. Um, and I think that, yeah, various times in my life, um, anxiety and insomnia have been kind of coupled you know where i'll be up at night thinking about a lot of things and um yeah. kind of experiencing that like faster heart rate and um yeah yeah because with bipolar 2 as laura and i have talked about like we often like have basically like restless thoughts that are just like boom 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 you can't settle down and you're very uh we can get very distractible to where like it might might be like distractible in a good way, like a bad way. I'm, I've noticed that it's more of in a good way. We're like, oh, I have to get this done. Oh, and I have to get this done. So like I'm doing like eight different projects and I'm being really productive. Might not be like getting anything done in general, but I'm making progress in a whole bunch of ways. I was just wondering, do you experience that or is that similar to your anxiety with like the distractibility? Um, yeah, I th- in a couple different ways. So number one, uh, at least for a few years now, I found that 
I've actually become less anxious when I have a few different projects on the go. I get more anxious mm-hmm. if I don't have anything to do. Uh, Me too. Where it's just like, mm-hmm. oh, now I don't have anything to like occupy my time, and I just get a little bit more uh, jittery about it. Um, the downside to that is that this is when my forgetfulness kind of uh, jumps up really high is when I do have those different projects because like, oh, I'm super focused on I have to get like these four or five things done. And then I realize, oh, I did not buy groceries for this week. (laughs) And I was supposed to do that. (laughs) Or it's like, I was supposed to like call this person. And I didn't because I had these four things that were occupying my thoughts for like the last 48 hours. And that's all I was Mm -hmm. focusing on. And that was all my attention that was put into it. So I definitely think there's like this positive where it's like being super focused gets you to finish and complete those things that you're focusing on, but at the expense of all the other stuff in your life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's cool to see how similar, uh, because with bipolar, like we have our, the ability to relate to those with like depression and severe depression and also those with like anxiety. Cause we have like the mania side and have like experienced like that bit, but I'm always like trying to figure out like how much of the similarities and in our next episode where we uh, are going to interview uh, how to ADHD um, uh, that we've already recorded that. And they talk about, Um, like one is a lot more hyperactive and the other one is a lot more like depressive. And so like the whole interview, I was just like, I felt like I was being pulled in between the two of them and like, Oh, I feel this, but I also feel this. Uh, so like that, yeah. So that's just really cool to like, kind of be able to relate to people. And like, that's kind of the goal of this podcast as well is to like, just, uh, create more empathy and understanding around these things. And like, I like that I'm learning along with everybody else. I I Uh, think that's important. I think the only difference that I can see is that I definitely do not go into those manic periods that, uh, mm-hmm. that I understand that a certain bipolar uh, people do. Uh, I kind of am, <laughs> I don't like to say it this way, but it's like I definitely am on like the Eeyore spectrum of, <laughs> of, of personalities. <laughs> where it's like, I'm kind of more of like a down, like uh, I'll say depressed, but I, I also don't like using that word because I think I don't mean the clinical version of depression. It's just more it's like, well, yeah, I'm fine. I'm doing stuff. <laughs> but I don't ever get like yeah, super it's... happy and like engaged. That's sort of Yeah. It's weird to be happy. Never, never do it. I don't do it. <laughs> it's two out of 10. Would um, not, would not do it again. <laughs> so Kyle, do you think that you could talk for a minute about your personal journey with anxiety and what, um, I'm really curious about kind of the moment where you got to the point of diagnosis and what led up to that and how anxiety was impacting your life before that. Sure. Yeah, I can definitely talk about that. Uh, because this is the second episode, I have not actually listened to any of your other episodes. So how uh, how mm. into it did they get? <laughs> like how personal um, did they I've, get? I've, you're, you're number two. Yeah. So all that we've had is just the two of us. And, and I got real deep. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, I got way too deep, and so I had to cut a bunch of the episode and redo it. Right. Uh, so you can get into it as much as you want uh, and spend as much time as you want. Uh, okay, so this is this is what I'll say, is that I, I think that really I've suffered from uh, anxiety from a pretty young age, and there was a few different things that were all kind of butting heads with each other. And so not to throw my parents under the bus, so to speak, but uh, I think that they're, I mean, I'm, I'm a middle child. There was three kids in the family. Uh, there was money issues. There's a lot of stuff going on when I was growing up. My dad up and decided that we were going to buy a farm and we moved to a farm to start raising cows. Uh, when I was six years old, <laughs> hold up, hold yeah. up. <laughs> you're you're being literally bred for an anxiety while you're breeding yeah, cows. Right. Is that correct? Exactly <laughs> okay. Right. So we're taking we're, we're doing this new venture. He wanted to raise his kids, uh, kind of in a rural setting, and so uh, that's that that's where we started from there. Uh, but but I bring that up because there was a lot of arguments that went on in my family growing up specifically between my parents and I think that I for whatever reason started to internalize those arguments as if I myself was causing it to happen and as an adult I can look back on that and be like no no, it was really nothing to do with me at all those were like my parents issues and I remember Mm -hmm. vividly having this goal it's like I'm gonna make it 24 hours without my parents like yelling at me for whatever reason 
And I would often oh, fail at that because I was like a five-year-old kid and I did stupid things because I was a five-year-old <laughs> kid. But again, it's like, okay, I've right. caused this to happen. And I think that's kind of where my anxiety started was because, and even to this day, I am a, an eternal people pleaser. I hate yeah. when there's even a little bit of conflict going on oh, around yes. me. Like I've done road trips with friends where like, there's like someone's a little bit short with someone and like, oh my gosh, like the whole world is ending inside my brain. Cause like, oh my goodness, like they're, they're going to kill each other. It's like, no, they're just having like a little bit of a disagreement. Like it's okay. It's fine. Um, so I think there is, there is that portion of it. And then again, at a very early age, like around five or six years old, I could start to understand that uh, I was, I was bisexual. Like I knew that I was attracted to both sexes and that was a big deal. Cause obviously I was growing up in a small town, uh, Alberta, which is kind of like the Texas of Canada. <laughs> so it's like, this right. is not, this is something that I absolutely cannot say. And my eternal fear was that that was going to get out and people were going to find out like the true self that, that, that I was. So there was this uh, personality uh, of me. There was the reality of home life. And I think that all kind of smashed together to be like, oh, like I just am constantly uh, feeling uh, not centered. Like I don't have like a, a happy medium. And so for I think that's just where the <laughs> where, where it all started from. Oh. Uh, yeah. Sounds like a hadron collider <laughs> of anxiety. That, that's right. <laughs> uh, it can create a black hole, but also anxiety in five-year-old Canadians. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A black hole in your heart. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so how did you end up going and getting your diagnosis? Okay, so this kind of progressed. So I was always like just a really anxious person. And the way that it flared up in me predominantly uh, in high school was that there was so many different things that I wanted to go and do, but that I was just too mm -hmm. anxious to go and try. So for instance, it's like, ah, I'd really like to go and try out for the school play, but there's no way. Like, And then... Uh, talking about like those obsessive thoughts like well this could happen and this could happen and this could happen and then well, like it just kind of extrapolated the uh, the weirdness of, of me is that it goes I can have these simultaneous diversions go happen which is like the best case scenario but also the worst case scenario all happening at the same time and it's kind of like parallel universe and then like my body like implodes because it's like trying to take on too much stimuli at the same time oh, i feel that so much so it's like oh, uh oh. like i want to go to the school play or like i want to go and talk to this person or it's like i'd like to be friends with this that guy over there but it's like i can't because of reasons and i, that I made up mm -hmm. in my head for the most part so when i went to university uh uh i, I think you you find, well, I, I'm going to make a generalization here. I think you find better friends when you go to university in many yeah, ways. Yeah, of course. Just because you're centralized mm -hmm. in like a specific stream or a specific topic that you can find people that are much more in tune with your, um, whatever, what you like and, and your beliefs and stuff like that. So my friends in, in university specifically were like, really called out like you seem like super depressed a lot of the time and you seem like super anxious a lot of the time and we don't really get why <laughs> because my anxiety is the worst when I meet new people but once I get to know someone over time I feel that I'm much more comfortable with them and I can I can open up a lot more and so when people see like what I call the real me that sometimes has to happen over like two or three weeks because I am very closed off when I first meet people. Yeah. Uh, I think they were just in tune with that a lot more. And even though I could probably have said to myself, you know what, like I am kind of depressed. I would never have maybe labeled it specifically as being like, I am a depressed person. Um, at mm -hmm. least not in, not in so many words. So I decided to take it upon myself. I decided, you know what, I am, I have my, uh, free healthcare up here in Canada. I might as well go get uh, a diagnosis. A <laughs> um, so I went to the local hospital and they actually did a, it wasn't Skype at that time. It was basically a video conference call with this doctor that was up in a city a few hours north of me. And so he called in, we had like a conversation for about an hour and he was like, oh, I think what it sounds like is you have this generalized anxiety disorder and he prescribed to me uh, a drug called Paxil. Have you heard of this before? 
Sounds familiar. I've heard of Paxil. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I took Paxil is what I did for like a couple months. I had to go through a bunch of different things. I actually had to have a nurse come out to my house and like take a blood Ooh. sample and a urine sample and all and ask me a ton of different questions. Did you get that for free too? I sure did. Oh, man. Oh, man. Man. there's we could we should have a whole podcast of just like how the difficulties and how more it's just more difficult than us to feel bad but I, like it, it is a huge oh, problem I, I, as, as far as just like uh like it's massive like that's why a lot of people don't get help is because of money like they just can't afford it that's why i feel a little bit blessed oh, about absolutely. that uh being up here in canada where it, it's so weird because i look from afar at the u.s and like i don't I don't, I don't get it. I don't really understand what the big uh, big deal is about uh, getting people the help that they need. Uh, but I also love the fact that in Canada, people have become super complacent about the fact that we do get a lot of this covered for us. It's like you have all this free health care and nobody ever uses it. It's like I know I know so <laughs> many people. They're like, yeah, I, don't, uh. I have like. My toe hanging on by a throat. I'm not gonna go to the hospital. I mean, I can just take it up. <laughs> like, Canadians are way too nice. Like, like, <laughs> Americans, we we use every aspect. We we drain every penny of that. Um, yeah, I was at a hostel where like is everybody from like every different country, and I always thought Canada was like the land of the free healthcare. And then I was talking to like some Australians, like, yeah, we have free healthcare. It's like, oh, what do you have? It's like we even have free dental and free this. Yeah, and the Canadians like, yeah, free dental. I know. I'm like, so jealous. Of that. <laughs> so just like this free healthcare, like competition and i'm the only american that's just like we pay for everything i have to pay for everything yeah <laughs> uh, i have i have no idea where we are right now <laughs> um oh you got prescribed paxil right. uh, so did that uh did that right. help uh so yes in a way uh, so it definitely helped me not be anxious anymore it really brought down my mood quite a bit however mm. it also eliminated almost every other emotion that I had. Mm. So meaning like I didn't feel sad, I didn't feel happy, I didn't feel uh. anxious. Um, and so that is the part that I didn't like a whole lot because I felt like I was just literally a shell of a person wandering around. It's like, yeah. cool, I don't feel super anxious anymore, but I also <laughs> don't feel anything anymore. Yeah, and w- which one would you rather have? You'd probably rather be anxious, right? Yeah, I mean, it's always that thing. It's like, what, what is it that actually makes you human, I guess? It's like, it's kind of like your emotions. Um, I'm not anti, uh, I'm not anti-drug. I think that absolutely people need it in a lot of different cases. For me, what I found with that particular medication, it just didn't help me in the way that I needed to. Now, again, mm-hmm. I was in my early 20s. I was a dummy. And so I was like, eh, I'm not going to take this anymore. And then I just stopped taking it and never went back and got it refilled. I never have. Like I just, I just stopped taking it cold turkey. Wow. Yeah. So Still. then when you went off the medication, um, <laughs> cold turkey, I'm curious, couple, two things. One, what did you experience immediately as a college kid, you know, whose system I'm sure was all wackadoo? And two, um, what have you developed as your kind of tools and mechanisms for handling your anxiety since then? Yeah. The, the tools certainly didn't come for quite a few years after that. What I did feel mm-hmm. immediately after it was, yeah, it was it was solely over like a few days. You, I could almost feel like I was being uh, colored in <laughs> is how I describe it. Is that it was like, oh, I'm wow. starting to feel things like I feel like oh. a human again uh, after a little bit. But then, of course, like the anxiety comes back. It's like, OK, well, I'm kind of back in, in uh, square one again for for me. This is where the self-esteem also plays a role because uh, my self-esteem was, was always like super, super low. Uh, and I mean, we were talking kind of before we started recording the podcast, like there was moments in high school where I was very much suicidal and had suicide, suicidal thoughts. Um, mm. And so I think uh, once I stop taking the drug uh, that self-esteem came back and the overriding thought that kept coming back was well you know what I don't know if I really deserve to be happy and so mm. why try mm. and so Ugh. I just didn't try uh, to be happy I, ha- I hate that I relate to that <laughs> like I've had oh man it sucks I know it's, it's a terrible mentality and he, again I think I think we sometimes overlook 
uh, ourselves to to the detriment of ourselves. Meaning that if I had heard somebody else say those exact words, I'd be like, no, like that's awful. Yeah. Like, let's go and find something that like will boost you up, or let's find some help for you. But when it was me saying that exact same thing to myself on like a daily basis, it was like, yeah, whatever. Like it's normal. Like I just I, this is just not going to happen for me, and I've accepted yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, you convince yourself after you say it, like it comes up in your head once and you're like, eh, that might be true. And then like you say it a few more times and then that just becomes a current thought that you have like every day, multiple times a day and you believe it to be true and it just messes with you. Yeah. Um, That's not true. It is not true. Not, it really, it really <laughs> isn't. Your mind is a liar a lot of the time. It's like the way that yeah. you think yeah. about yourself, a lot of times you have convinced yourself so strongly that you have to like break out of it by saying no my brain is lying to me right now yeah yeah i i have a friend who's a who's a counselor who um has has studied a lot about you know the ego and all of the various functions that it has and um she's constantly reminding me especially if i'm having anxiety she's constantly reminding me you know remember that your mind is great for keeping you alive and safe and it wants to keep you safe you know and so we create these narratives because the beliefs that we've created around ourselves like those stories those negative stories um in the past haven't killed us (laughs) they've kept us safe and so it's beneficial you know according to our unbalanced mind to just stay in that that place of of fear and protection because it comes from that that place of like really wanting to be safe you know yeah. but if 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 gone unchecked and un um yeah. i guess uh tended it will just run away yeah it's know? fascinating stuff i mean not to derail the podcast too much here but there's uh, two years of science that i find absolutely like intriguing which is brain science because they still have not figured out what most of our brains actually do and how it yeah. actually works uh, mm-hmm. And the other one is actually space exploration, just because I think it's cool to find new planets and stuff like that. <laughs> but I think um, for all the cool things like that would bring, as far as like space exploration, I think it's cooler to be like, um, let's like literally look at ourselves and try and figure out why our brains are trying to do what they're trying to do. Because uh, mm-hmm. yeah, figuring that out and tapping into that probably do wonders for for mental health. Yeah, I've been listening to like the mu- I don't know if you heard of the musical. Is it called like Dear Evan, Dear Evan Hansen, Hansen or yeah, something? Yeah. Oh man, it's like uh, it, it's I've never related like I haven't seen it, but I've never related to a song more than it's like is it waving through waving a window, through window or something? Yeah, yeah. Oh man, it's just like he he's art he's already breaked before. What's the line? Do you remember the line? I'm glad that you've seen this because I. <laughs> um, it's it, it's basically just saying that like he's given up before even trying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that's so common with um, depression and anxiety where like you give up before you're trying. Like it starts with something like, uh, I'm never, I'm never going to like, I can't do this one thing. And it's like, and I also can't do this thing. Like, and I'm always sad, so I can never be happy. Right, and I'm yeah. like, I can't, I can't be happy. I don't deserve happiness. Yeah, like I, I'm not doing anything to do ha- happiness. And like, I'm not doing anything because I've already given up and then not deserving happiness gets into this. Like, not only I, I don't deserve happiness, but I hate myself. Yeah. And like I talked about in the previous podcast about how I had like a cycle of like just hating myself. And then that cycle of hating myself turned into like, like I am nothing, <laughs> like yeah. I am worthless. And if you're worthless, why not? Why you're a burden. And so if you're a burden, why not just kill yourself? And so like these cycles, just like it's a snowball effect. It's a negative snowball effect that you can literally trick your brain into thinking that all of these wrong things are true in reality whereas if you if we were just willing to talk more about mental illness and just what we're thinking like we could stop it like way like 20 steps before we even got close to that and like once you like give yourself the tools to be able to like no like like you have to like battle your negative thoughts with positive thoughts and so like just giving yourself the the tools to be able to like create uh uh, correct your negative thought behavior uh, is like extremely helpful and useful. And I think that everybody should like have more of these like CBT and DBT and all those types of therapy, or at least uh, an understanding of them to be able to do that. Cause nobody, nobody should feel like they're worthless and nobody should hate themselves or feel like they don't deserve happiness. 
Uh, was that yeah. was that the phrase specifically, Tyler, that you would say to yourself? Like, did you actually say those words in your head? Like, I hate myself. Yeah, it was. I hate myself. I hate myself because like I've abandoned all my friends. I hate myself because I've ignored all of them. I've ignored all of them because uh, because I'm a monster. Like that was a phrase that I used. Like I'm a monster. And then um, I actually I talked after. Uh, I, I talked to Kyle when I was in a super hypomanic state, mm-hmm. <laughs> Laura. <laughs> so like he actually remember like this, it yeah. remembers that. Um, <laughs> but, so I was talking to a lot of people in that state because all I wanted to do was talk to people. And I talked to one of my friends who I won't name, uh, but like I literally called him and it happened to have been. Uh, he literally said that last night, the previous night was the saddest night that he'd ever have yet. And that was because he saw a photo on Facebook of his friends having a bunch of fun without him. Oh, wow. And so, like, it's so sad to have something that's supposed to be happy uh, and joyful be turned into depression because you don't have that. And then he said the exact thought that he had was, I don't deserve to be happy. Yeah, it's weird how it turns into, like, literally, it's just a, a picture of friends being happy, and then you turn it into being, like, I don't deserve to be happy. Like that is how yeah. you, how it gets into yeah. And all it took for me to like find that out was just asking him questions and not giving up on asking him questions. And he said that like he'd never talked about his emotions like that with anybody else at college. Of course I was in a hypomanic state, so I was just bombarding everybody with every question and not let it not even seeing like how uh, I was affecting people emotionally. But in this case it worked out for the better. That's good. That's good. Uh, so like I'd encourage people like if you notice like any depressive behavior like don't you don't have to like push other people but like just ask them like hey how are you feeling like don't don't say uh how are you or how are you doing just say try to change your vernacular sometimes just like how are you feeling today i've started using that and i like the responses i get are usually a lot better than just the one word good yeah uh and you can tell a lot from somebody they actually are honest about how they're feeling and then you can just go from there Honestly, it's good. Um, yeah. to, to tie this up with a nice little bow, because it was bugging me, the exact lyric from Dear Evan Hansen <laughs> is, I've learned to slam on the brake before I even uh, turn the key, is what it says. Yes. Oh, man. Everybody go listen to that song, and then go listen to Owl City's version of it, because I love <laughs> Owl City. That's hilarious. Well, that's, that's funny, that sentence. That sounds exactly like what you were saying, Kyle, where you, um, when you were in the anxiety space... Mm-hmm. You were having your your mind would you would want to go try out for the play or do whatever and you would just have this whole tree growing out in front of you of like what can happen and what can happen and why you have to stop doing it before you can even start. Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, because it seems like anxiety and depression have some similar ways of manifesting in those mm. kind of really busy thoughts. Absolutely. And I think that anxiety definitely led to a depression in me. Uh so I had these grand illusions. Like when I was in high school, I was so um, inspired by certain movies and TV shows. And I was really into Broadway. And I was just like, I want to be a writer. I want to do all this cool stuff. I want to be a producer. And then I went to a university and got my English degree. And so I was like, yeah, this is all this good stuff. And then I moved to a city right after I, I was done uh, university and didn't do anything. <laughs> Uh, I was like, well, I need money. So I got the a night shift. I worked at a 7-Eleven uh, nice. from 10 p.m. No. to 6 a.m. is what my shift oh, was. Oh, no. It just breeds depression. It does. Oh, it honestly no. is like, weirdly was oh. like probably the worst mental state I've ever been in, or at least one of them. Yeah. But also couple. What do you, what do you think about when you're working at 7-Eleven at those hours? It's just like, like, why am I here? Like, it just. I felt, uh, and the worst thing is like this feels like it's out of a sitcom or a movie but there was like yeah. um some you uh, sorry some high school people i knew came in one night uh, and they saw me in my no. I was like hey i thought you were like smart i'm like oh uh, like kill me now like it's just like i don't oh. want to even talk to you. <laughs> like, the worst experience i have, have uh. to deal with what, what was weird is that that was also the time though because my sleep pains were just so off the charts of what everyone else was uh, I watched the entire series of Buffy the Vampire Slayer in like a month and a half, which I had never watched. And that's why I've become a lifelong nice. fan of that show. 
Um, I don't know why I went for that fight because she's killing vampires, and I was like, I felt like a vampire at the time. So I psychoanalyzed myself to say that, that was going on. Uh, but there, so I was, I was, I was depressed. I wasn't doing anything. I was having these anxious thoughts all the time. That's all I was thinking of was like my wasted potential, and then nothing could get me to actually take step one of of that journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to make a really long convoluted story short, I was without a computer for a while. I eventually got a computer and I had been so into YouTube and without uh, a computer, I didn't, there, there was no really smartphones at that time. Um, or not as prevalent as they are now, at least I got my computer back. I logged onto YouTube after not having watched it for like months and months. And one of the first videos I watched was by Hank Green and he was saying, Hey, you should come to this thing called VidCon. I'm like, oh, what's this thing? I don't know what that is. And so kind of on a real whim, I, I, I don't know exactly why I decided, yeah, I'm absolutely doing this. But I bought a ticket for the first VidCon that was ever held and flew down to wow. LA and, and wow. did it. Like seven years ago. Yeah, all, all by myself. <laughs> like I didn't know anyone. I didn't go with anyone. It was just oh, me. Man. And I went down there which is the most anxiety-inducing thing. Yeah. This is, this, and honestly, the first year, I was like, Mr. Wallflower didn't talk to anybody. It was just like there to experience the convention. I just sat there quietly and like watched things going on. And then went to my hotel room. Like, why didn't I talk to anyone? I should have talked to people. And I like, got into that weird headspace. Oh, yeah. But the, <laughs> the positive that happened from that was that there was a few speeches that happened. And one of them was like, Zay Frank was there, and Hank Green gave mm-hmm. a good talk to about. And were you in college still? No, at this I was. Time? I, or were you I was graduated. College? I was. So I was. Okay. I was not working at Seven Eleven okay. anymore. I had yeah. just come off working at um as a manager for a bookstore, and for whatever reason, I was super inspired. And the day I got back, I made the really the first YouTube video. I had made a few oh, beforehand awesome. and uploaded them, but really, it was like, no, I'm making a, a video every single week. And that is what my mental capacity is going to go into. And so that is what started me making a video every every single week. And I found that it, I'm, I'm still anxious. And even to this day, I'm a still I'm an anxious person. But it lessened quite a bit because my focus was on something. I wasn't getting yeah. into these weird thought spirals and spinning out of control. I was like, I'm focused on this. And then I layered on podcasting. And I layered on writing. And I layered on a whole bunch of other things onto my plate to to kind of lessen to lessen that load yeah i'm feeling that i'm doing like the same as far as like freelancing doing i've I've started doing videos once a week as well picking up a podcast taking like summer classes doing more contract patreon work and so like i don't know if this is like escapism from my anxiety and um and like depression uh, or if like this is because it's definitely healthy to like get stuff done and like have goals. I'm, like I love that aspect, but I don't know like if it's bad to an extent as far as like I'm avoiding what I'm actually like what my body's wanting to feel, yeah. even though that's probably a bad thing I mean, that my body wants to feel. Yeah, I go back and forth with that a little bit because there's an essence of like I'm just masking what my true self is or something like that. But yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm very I'm very conscious of the fact that even though I say yes to a bunch of different things that people want to do and collaborate on, that I'm also human. So there has to be certain times that, you know what, I've already committed to do four things today. Mm-hmm. I have to say no. Like, I cannot yeah. do absolutely everything that I want to do. I have to kind of pick and choose the projects that I go into. Yeah. And do you also, Kyle, do you find that... Um if you're, you know, approaching maybe a creative collaboration or a podcast interview or a video where you're still working with people and maybe they're new people, does having it framed within a creative project reduce the anxiety that you feel around these new experiences and new people? Like 120% because I find the hardest thing for me is like chit chat stuff. I'm just awful at it. Like I'm (laughs) Mm -hmm. just so bad. Which is something I really envy uh, Tyler about because I see him go around and like dude, I saw, I, and be like a social little butterfly and like oh, talking to people. I'm like, oh, oh I just, dude, I am not at all. So, I'm, I'm forcing myself out of the shell true. that I've been built up. Maybe, for the but this is, <laughs> dude, uh, we are so the same. I'm just faking it, dude. Maybe I'm faking it. Maybe you're faking it better, but I mean, this is uh, so. Uh, 
I'm going to say it anyways. But at, at this last year's VidCon, I weaseled my way into the Patreon party. And um, yeah, <laughs> I walk in, I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. Like, there's like 30 people that I really respect that are in this room. And I really want to go and talk to them. I have nothing to talk to them about. I don't want to go up to them and be like, <laughs> like your videos. And then like, it stops there. Like, that's just like the worst. Yeah, yeah. It's just, like, what can I talk to them about? I don't know what to talk about. I eventually was able to like go over to Andrew Huang and be like, I really like that you talk about your like, music theory. And that was able to like evolve into like a five minute conversation. Yeah. But everyone else I was too scared to go up and talk to. I was like, I can't. I can stick to the Canadians. That's fine. But I can't talk to anyone else. Yeah. I feel like the reason, uh, like this year's VidCon especially, um, I met Kyle at a VidCon like four, four years yeah, ago or three, three years ago years or something. Ago, yeah. um, and so like we do that and Laura was at this past VidCon. So we all have like these VidCon stories. So we're just going to talk about it for a second. <laughs> uh, but this was like the first one that I've been like feeling good and not depressed. And it was also very different for the past ones. But I feel like I've got that more social butterfly aspect because I know the depression and the social anxiety aspect of just like, I hate like being in the circle or like barely in the circle of friends and like everybody's talking except for me. I don't know what to say. Uh, what do you do? Or like you come up to a table, like how, how do you get introduced? Like, I, I don't know how to start. So I know like the hardest thing possible is to like start, like it's just to get, but once like you get started and like introduced, like you can just like, go most of the times and so all i was right. doing basically this vidcon was just like introducing this person to this person cool. uh and like it was it was so cool to be able to see uh because a lot of my friends weren't even there this year uh and like i didn't make that many friends but like i was able to connect like my like four different friend groups to all to like each other and like yeah. to see them hit it off and so it was really like it's enjoyable for me to see that because i know like how much uh, I hate feeling alone when I'm surrounded by a lot of other people. Yeah, that, and so, that is the worst since, feeling, feeling alone in a sea of people. Uh, but this exactly. I mean, this year I did very specifically go with the intent of like, I'm going to push myself slightly out of my comfort zone. I'm going to go to some of the networking things that are there. I'm going to try and talk to new people because doing the opposite hasn't really worked for me very well. So I might <laughs> yeah. as well try this. And it worked out really well. So I have to say it was a bit yeah. of a success. That Did way. you have any like anxiety inducing situations or like any problems with your anxiety flaring up while you were there this year? Uh, I think the only, I mean, the party was probably the biggest one just because like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to be like <laughs> thrown yeah. out or something like that or like stumble over myself. Uh, luckily, it was like super loud in there, so I could barely hear what anyone was saying. So I mean, it was it was fine. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask you like more of how does your anxiety show itself the most? Because like you mentioned about like worst thing is like having to like uh, do chit chat, like which I also hate. Small talks, the worst. Just get to the meat. Laura's, Laura knows I, <laughs> we're like we're all the same. I, I tell we're all creative. So <laughs> the worst is that the current job that I have is, is retail. So I'm doing it all the time. Uh, yeah. which is like aggravating. Um, I also am a trainer, so it's easier for me to talk to a group because it's like, we're all doing mm -hmm. the same thing. So we're all kind of in the same boat and that's easy enough for me to do. But if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, it's like, oh, okay. Um, yeah. I honestly, all I want to do is stop talking about the weather and go straight to like, what are your feelings about your dad? Like, just tell me about that. I'm yeah. like, oh, I, know. <laughs> uh, I know every, the biggest question I want to ask everybody is just like, what's your lowest point in life yeah. that you've ever yeah. hit? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, how does, cause I've noticed, um, I'll just talk about what I think my anxiety, if I have anxiety, I'm not even convinced that I have it, even though my doctors think I do. Um, it, it's more of just like flaring up at night, and it's surrounded by the fact that maybe people don't like me because like they're not responding to this or like they ignored this or this happened. And like that also like connects with like I like like you were talking about, like thinking of all of these like problems and like things like that'll never happen. And then also thinking like the best possible outcomes of these. So like I'm like going my mind is racing through all the possible social scenarios that could happen the next time I talk to this specific person that I care about and then like I look through like all of my messages and like see all the one only focus on the ones I didn't get a response from mm -hmm. just like maybe like nobody cares at all in the first place 
Uh, maybe everybody's faking that they enjoy being around me. Uh, and then it just kind of like spirals from there. Uh, that especially if it's like a, a few people that like I super care about who I haven't heard from in a while or have I felt been ignoring me. And it's just like in like you were talking about like bees in your stomach. Mm -hmm. Like mine, like I just feel like everything's caving in on the like in it's like in the mm. stomach area. So it's more of just like curl up into a ball and like almost like convulse <laughs> and like have like that type of physical reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And it's only like I can be around people and like if I needed to, like I know that I could like probably shut that off if like somebody were to like walk into the room. Like it's not like an uncontrollable possible thing but it's just like to me in those moments like it's all all that i know to do and like i can't get out of it but like if like any yeah i don't know like what do you feel is it more of like when you're out that you feel like anxiety or do you have any similar it's thing? more like the hour before i'm gonna do something whether that's okay going to work mm. uh, going to a bar afterwards uh meeting someone new going for a trip or something it's like that anticipation like my mind just starts going a bunch of different ways and I think that social media has in a sense exacerbated it because there's I'm seeing images and and, and text posts from all over the place they're like oh like this person's like living the idealized life and like I'm not there yet or I haven't achieved this mm -hmm. this uh this I don't know life goal that I feel like I should have achieved by this point I, I find that my mind mm -hmm. tends to go that way, which is like, oh, I haven't achieved this, this, or this, or what if all this stuff happens? Like, my mind kind of uh, plays it around that way. Uh, so, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's the anticipation. I'd say mine's the same, mine's the same anticipation-wise of, like, social situations and, like, how they can go. And it's just, like, I don't, I have no clue where this person is at. So, I have to think of every possible scenario and every like how can i best word this text and so like i'll literally draft like oh a gosh. letter and like go over, do like both of our oh visions my yeah i have i have spent <laughs> obnoxious amounts of times writing like a one-line text to somebody <laughs> yes. like no don't oh, like, man it was that the, is that the right emoji i'm sending with this what is that gonna yeah. come off as? Yeah. but if i get like as soon as i get in those even if it's a difficult conversation i've noticed that like i don't have to worry as long as like i can have that conversation but like it's the fact that like maybe I'm never gonna have that conversation and maybe I just lost a friend and I've been completely like outed or ghosted or I did something bad and I just don't know about it. So I'm just constantly thinking of all the bad things that I might have done and then I'm wondering like what I did wrong. Right. Um, uh, but then like it's not like into social situations. So that's why I'm hesitant to like say it's anxiety. Because like a lot of people go into like those so like hey i'm going out to like this party and i feel like super anxious about it i usually don't yeah it's, it's usually relate. well there's different types of anxiety oh sorry do you want to do you want to no you finish your thought first talk oh i was just gonna say there's different types of anxiety you know like i i'm not sure what if what you're experiencing tyler is anxiety or, or not but it sounds mm -hmm. like it to me um but yeah i mean there's social anxiety there's there's all these other sorts of ways that it manifests yeah um I'm curious how how you handle that hour before, you know, like Kyle, you're saying that's the worst time for you. So what is it? Because especially since part of this podcast, we want our listeners to acquire tools and think about ways that they can manage these things in their lives. Like, how do you get through that hour or that 10 seconds of intensity? For me, I actually do have to move around. I find it actually gets worse if yeah, I have yeah. to stay still. So it's like, I'm going to walk up. I'm going to walk up and down. Uh, it doesn't have to be pacing. I just have to be well. constantly moving. So I could be like going in a circle or something around like a big, like a block or something <laughs> like that. Uh, it's a bit of a psych up. I will listen to like a podcast or a, or a song mm -hmm. or something just to be getting podcast. Better. That's, yeah. that's exactly podcast or music. Yeah, podcast <laughs> or music. Uh, Cause I think what it comes down to too, is like I can get into the mood. I can, I can do the faking part of it for like a good hour mm -hmm. and a bit. Um, yeah. After a while though, it's like, okay, I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> And like two, three hours in, if I'm just still, if I'm getting that anxious feeling, it's like, 
I'm cutting the cord. I'm I'm going. Mm-hmm. I've made my appearance. Uh, but like yeah. I have to go. That's why I like go somewhere. <laughs> that's why I like being right. bipolar because I feel like I can I do the same thing, but like once I'm there until like after an hour, like I can stay on like that right. wavelength of just like being pumped up and like have that energy. Laura, are you the same? Where like you can kind of maintain a heightened level for longer than you think? Um, I don't know. Probably. I mean, I think that in a lot of social situations, I tend to to match. I call myself a matcher. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if I'm really nervous about, I mean, I've had social anxiety also, definitely. Um, and I'm a performer, you know, and so for a long yeah. time I was dealing with with that, just being anxious before getting on stage. And that shows up in all sorts of weird ways where I get like really negative and really shut down and super just un- like uncomfortable and tense. Um, and yeah, and usually it's that first like first song on stage and it's gone or, yeah, yeah. you know, meeting like actually getting to the the party and having the first conversation with the first person there and then you're able to kind of relax because there's other people around or music or whatever to diffuse that energy and I start letting go of my own thoughts around it um yeah, yeah I definitely I, I really identify that with that because I've done too. like a few different live shows like on stage and stuff before and I think that mm-hmm. people's perception of anxiety means that you're just like sitting by yourself like rocking back and forth like you just can't go outside mm-hmm. I mean there's definitely Times where it's like, right. oh, I'm so glad that person canceled. I didn't want to even do, I didn't want to do this. I'm so thankful yeah. for the cancellation. <laughs> um, but I, I wonder what it is that that uh, there's a lot of people who are super anxious or have depression that actually go into performing arts a lot. I just find that a fascinating yeah. Yeah. Um, aspect. One thing I, d- I just wanted to mention before we run out of time was I think part of that what really helped me was uh, about four years ago, I really recognized like, ah, there's just a few things here that I really need help with uh, mental health wise. And so I got in contact with a psychiatrist to just unpack a lot of stuff. And this is why I know that I think I've internalized a lot of stuff from my early childhood into my adulthood. Mm-hmm. And Tyler, you mentioned that like you had those thoughts, like I hate myself, or, like I'm not worthy. Uh, I'm not even joking. Yeah, like that was a good 10 years of my life where every oh, single day i'm, I'm oh. telling you every single day the thought i hate myself went through my head and i told the psychiatrist this and we had this like two <laughs> sessions of a conversation um and she had me do these different exercises but it got to the point where now if that even slightly flares through my head i'm like no i don't that's ridiculous that's a stupid that's yeah a ridiculous you, have, you have to cut it off immediately yeah. like that's wow. the this is the illustration that i give uh to people uh, so like a lot of times when, when people uh, cut themselves once they go or after self-harm and they tr- get like treatment, there's some so, some treatment for that would be like, here, put a rubber band around your wrist. And every time you feel the temptation to cut, uh, just snap that rubber band and hit it against your wrist because that's not going to actually hurt you or do any mm-hmm. lasting damage or anything. Uh, and so like I take that as an example and we need to be doing the exact same thing to our minds. And so as soon as you have that negative thought of I don't deserve happiness or I hate myself, you have to like stop it immediately within the first three seconds. If you let it go for longer than that, it's just going to fester and repeat itself eventually. So like that is the most important thing that I've found is cutting it off. And so the two most things, uh, cutting it off in the head and the root problem uh, immediately in, in your brain. And then also thinking about the positives. So begin every day with thankfulness. A lot of people use meditation. Uh, I'm I'm a ver- I'm a, a man of faith, and so like that plays a huge role into how I deal with uh, my depression and my bipolar. Uh, and so like there's all these tools that everybody can have, but like generally thankfulness is probably one of the biggest keys. So like be positive. Think of something that makes you happy. That's on the opposite spectrum of this, um, but. Anyways, uh, I wanted to, uh, we, we asked a couple questions towards the end, but before we get there, um, I want to just like, could you uh, basically tell us like, what was your lowest point? And because uh, I know uh, we've talked a little bit about it. So you were thinking this for 10 years. What was your like huge low point and how did you get out of it? If there was a yeah, huge I mean- point. There was a low point in high school where they had those suicidal thoughts that 
um, uh, I'd never officially acted upon. I would say that my lowest moment where I knew that I needed to get help was that I was uh, discovering two things. Um, one, uh, I would not have described myself as an alcoholic, but really I was because I was coming home mm. and um, I've never been much of a beer guy. So I had like um, basically wine coolers, little ciders and stuff like that. That I'm not even joking, would probably have like three or four of those uh, every night and then they go to sleep. Wow. Like that was like my, my pattern that I get into. I was like, mm, first off, that needs to stop. Um, I decided that I didn't want to be 230 pounds anymore. So I started running. You were 230 pounds? Was, yeah. Uh, so we're gonna post a picture on the patreon kyle is like the skinniest yeah, dude yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness so yeah it's funny you go looking at my videos from like four or five years that. ago it's like me pudgy faced is what, what it was uh anyway so yeah. exercising helped and then going um to uh, to a psychiatrist helped but my lowest point was that uh getting into that mindset of hating myself so much yes i was creating i was diverting my um energies elsewhere but i still hadn't really fixed the underlying problems that I was facing. So it was just mm -hmm. recognizing like, oh man, like as cheesy as it's going to sound, because I know that everyone says this, but you have to, I realized I had to start liking myself before mm. I could expect other people to like me. So uh, yeah. I started saying, I need to focus on me. And I spent a good two years, like really focusing on myself and like bumping up my self-esteem. Yeah. Ooh. and did you work with the um psychiatrist that whole time like the, um I, I, have you been with them consistently no i i did or? a psychiatrist for a year um and she okay. I, like i mean she really really helped me i the the craziest thing uh there was the hardest exercise i found and i thought it was gonna be so easy when she first said it but she was like noticing things i was saying like i need you to do this for me kyle and it was to look at myself in the mirror for five minutes. Oh boy, did I find oh, that the hardest oh, thing man. to do. Oh. I didn't realize I did. Did you have to say I love yes, you? Yes, she asked me to do that too. Oh man. I was assigned that one. Look in the mirror and oh, say I love man. you while making eye contact but with Kyle, yourself. But Kyle, how many times before that did you look in the mirror and say I hate myself? Because well, I used to do that yeah. all the time. No, I was, I, I, was always, I was always internalized <laughs> that I actually had discovered that I actually don't remember the last time I looked at myself in the mirror. Like I had been oh, subconsciously it was that bad. myself. Oh, you're reverting. So actually looking at myself, like I was like crying after like 20 seconds. Like I was oh, like, oh, man. Oh, break down. But it actually really helped me like, a whole lot. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. And so what is your, uh, what's probably the worst thing that you have to deal with uh, that comes with anxiety? Is there a specific thing that's the worst part of it? I think the most difficult part. The most difficult part for me is that I know that it still holds me back. And in some cases, it's really little mm -hmm. things. Uh, I always mention this, but there's, I, I see a lot of people like they're huggers is what I call them. Like they like to hug people when they meet them. It's like, oh, I want to be that person. But I always like. Oh, dude, I love I know. hugging people. And I like doing it too. <laughs> um, I mean, we have mutual <laughs> friends like Nick and Chris Taniguchi who are like the best huggers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love yeah. it. But it's like when I. When I know someone, when I'm meeting someone I've known for a while or new friends that I'm making, it's like, that's kind of my initial impulse. I want to do it. But I always like, nope, I can't do that because all these thoughts go through, mm. my, through my head. Like, do they uh, want me to? I don't know if they want me to. And if I do that, like, yeah. no one, like it just goes <laughs> down. And so I prevent myself from like really pursuing deeper relationships, I think, is what, what it comes down to. Um, so that's the hardest part for me is like, I know that it's okay. doing this. And so it's pushing through that sometimes. Like, I'm just going to try it and see if it works. <laughs> Yeah, and to counter that, we can end it with the question of what is your favorite part of having anxiety? Are there any like big positives that you find of it? For me, I think that the the thing that it's given me is that I do tend to be a quieter person because of it. Because I am a little bit fearful for like mm -hmm. stepping over people or talking over people. Um, I listen a lot more. And so it's really fascinating mm -hmm. if you sit and like listen to what other people are saying, you'd be like, even if arguments start, it's like, you know, you're not listening to what this other person is saying. Like you're, you're getting mad at something that they either they haven't said, haven't done, uh, or, or something like that. So I think being able to listen to people more acutely, you're like, oh, I know exactly what you're saying, or I understand what you, what you mean and be able to verbalize that back to them 
because you're not trying to speak right. to say something. You're speaking because you understand what the person is saying. Mm. Oh man, that's Dude, awesome! Oh, man. <laughs> snaps. That's a great snaps. anxiety superpower. Oh, man. I think I think that's a that's a perfect way to end it off. So uh, thank everybody for listening. Thank you, Kyle, for joining us. Uh, Kyle's Twitter is the Kyle Marshall on Twitter, and he does so many things. Yes. So I feel like we should just leave it to that. You can find the Assumptions Podcast, the whatever this is podcast, his videos, yes. just all the things that he when, does. When aliens um, come to what's to, your to Earth, YouTube channel? My YouTube channel, you can search for um kyle marshall i believe you can go to youtube.com and it's like the fifth kyle result or is it the- <laughs> that will also get you <laughs> yeah sounds good um <laughs> and you can find us on mr feels podcast.com and uh support us on patreon at patreon.com slash mr feels uh i think it's mr feels it could be mr feels podcast i i don't know i can't remember try both of them we'll figure it out <laughs> <laughs> you should probably figure that out before you tag that yeah, i should probably <laughs> i should be more prepared for this podcast is what what we're all coming to the same conclusion uh all right thank you for joining us thank you for listening uh bye bye i feel like i should end it with a different word than bye Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. Get out. (laughs) Get out.